Hi everyone, I'm uh, John Lindsay. I'm a professor of geomatics at the University of Guelph in the geography department. I'm also one of the two co-founders for White Box Geospatial. Uh, I haven't done one of these videos before, this is my first. Uh, I am the developer of White Box Tools, so generally I'm working in the, in the back end, uh, and my business partner's a little bit more, Anthony's a little more front end oriented. But uh, today I've decided to give you guys a little bit of a demonstration of something that I'm pretty excited about. In addition to being the developer of Whitebox Tools Open Core, I also previously developed Whitebox Geospatial Analysis Tools or Whitebox GAT. And most recently, we've released Whitebox Workflows for Python, which is the product that I'd like to talk to you about today if I can. So I'm going to do that by way of demonstration. And in this case, it's actually going to be a fairly practical demonstration about something that I ran into just yesterday, in fact. So yesterday I was working on um, a project for my, own, for my own research, and for that I required this air photo that you can see here in QGIS of uh, an area in London, Ontario. Beautiful city if you've ever been. I was messing around with uh, canny edge detection for, um, for key line or break line um, uh, mapping in this in this area and uh, to do that I decided that it would probably benefit from applying a smoothing filter or a low pass filter. Uh, the ideal one for this type of thing available in white box tools is the bilateral low pass filter and that's because the bilateral low pass filter will smooth uniform areas without um, blurring edges unlike say a mean filter or a median a median filter um, and you can see that here. So I've just shown the bilateral filter output. You can see it's quite a bit smoother than the original air photo is, but that uh, break lines or, or key lines within the image are in fact preserved. So that's the bilateral filter that we see here. Um, it occurred to me while I was doing this that it would be quite interesting to see a high pass bilateral filter. A high pass filter is the opposite of a low pass filter or a smoothing filter in that it accentuates the high frequency sort of short spatial scale variation within the image. Uh, in other words, it's usually created by taking the original image and differencing a high, a high sorry, a low pass filter from, from it. That's how you create a, a high pass filter. And Whitebox doesn't currently have a high pass bilateral filter, but it occurred to me that it might actually be useful for applications of mapping uh, local texture within an image would emphasize local texture, I think, fairly well. And so, um, you know, I thought about, hey, maybe I should, maybe I should develop a high pass bilateral filter for white box tools. But when I thought about that, well, you know, first I wanted to be able to see what the output of that would look like um, uh, before I invest time, because it's a fairly involved thing to create a new tool for white box tools. I've done it hundreds of times, so trust me on that one. Um, it takes a fair bit of time. And well, I thought to myself, well, how am I going to see the output to see if it's worthwhile to do this? And that's when it occurred to me, oh, well, I have white box workflows for Python and it is perfectly suited to this sort of application. So I thought perhaps today as a way of demonstration of using white box workflows that we would develop this tool together so that we could visualize the output. Uh, again, if I were to do this properly, then I would want to write it in Rust code rather than Python, uh, which is what the rest of, of um, white box is written in because that's a very high performance language for sure. So let's do this together if we will. So here I've opened up VS code and I am um, going to going to um, within the file that I've created of, of high pass um, bilateral dot pi start my Python script. So I do that by importing white box workflows which I've previously installed on my machine. Now, I begin by setting up the white box environment. So I create a variable, you can call it WBE for white box environment, is equal to white box workflows dot WBE. So that is an instance of my white box environment. The white box environment contains all of the settings that tell your script how to interact with white box. In particular, I want to determine whether or not when I run a tool, I want that tool to be chatty. I want it to output to the to the terminal. So that is verbose. And in this case, I would kind of like to see the output. Maybe it's the case that if you're running many, say, 
dozens or hundreds of tools that you don't want to see the output of each individual one. But in our case, I would like to see that. I also need to set the working directory. So in this case, that would be where the data lies. So I'm going to go back to QGIS for a minute, and I'm going to find where this image is stored. So that's the image path and directory name. Going back to VS Code, now I can set up my working directory. Oops, Control 2, there we go, and I'm going to grab the image name. We're going to use that in a minute when we open the image. So now I'm going to create or, or read the image that we're working with into memory. So for that, I'm going to call this image image. And we're going to use the, um, the white box uh, read raster function to this. We could read multiple rasters in at one time, but I'm just reading in a single one. And that's the name of that raster that we're working with. All right. So now, obviously, now that I have the original image for a high-pass filter, all we would really need to do is perform a smoothing or a low-pass filter. And for that, we're going to do a bilateral filter. Bilateral is equal to WBE dot. The white box environment contains all of the tool functions in white box. This requires an input raster, which in our case is called image. When I ran this previously, when we saw in QGIS that bilateral filter, I set the sigma dist value to 2.0. That's measured in pixels. And I set the sigma int to 0.08. You generally get that by experimenting with different um, parameter values. And of course, if we were to develop this as a full tool, as a high pass bilateral uh, filter tool, then those would be user inputs in the same that the input image and working directory would be inputs. Okay, so now to perform a high pass filter, effectively, as I said, you really just need to difference the two rasters, the original raster from the, the smooth raster. And we could, of course, do that very simply in white box workflows by literally differencing these two raster objects. So we could say I pass is equal to image minus bilateral. And that would generally work for us. This literally would difference the two rasters on a, on a cell by cell basis. The problem that we have though is that it's going to difference the raw values contained within the grid cell. And in many cases, this tool is going to be run on, as is the case with our input image, a red, green, blue color image, meaning that each pixel contains not one, but rather three individual values, one for red, green, and blue. And in fact, when we run the bilateral filter tool, it recognizes that when an input image contains RGB values, that instead of running it on the raw values, it transposes that RGB value color space instead to hue, saturation, and intensity values. That's a simple linear transformation from the one color space to the other color space. And then it runs the filtering on the intensity data rather than the RGB values themselves. So we probably need to set our tool up so that like the bilateral tool, it can handle both input images that are floating point continuous values like the intensity image was, or RGB values. And so this is going to be a little bit more complex than what we have set up here. First off, <clears throat> we're going to need some mechanism for knowing whether or not we're working with, in fact, color data. So here I'm going to create a variable called is color, and I'm going to find out whether my input image contains color data or not. For that, I get that information from the configs object of the uh, input raster, the image raster. And the configs contains all kinds of metadata about the raster, the columns, the number of rows, the north, south, east, west, the minimum and maximum values, all kinds of things here. But the one that we're most interested in in figuring out whether or not we're dealing with color data is the data type. And the data type can be floating point, 32-bit, 64-bit, integer values of various bit depths, and of course, it can contain RGB data. So 
there's also a method in here that tells us if it's any of these RGB values. So 24-bit RGBs, 48-bit RGB rasters, or RGB rasters that also contain opacity data, RGBA, 30-bit, 2-bit. So this method of isColorData basically says whether the input raster is any of these particular data types. In fact, while we're at it, we may as well grab a number of other variables that we'll likely end up using from the configs, like, for example, the number of rows. imageconfigs.rows and the number of columns. And the node data value. There we go. Now we're ready. So the next thing that we need to do is uh, effectively loop through this raster one grid cell at a time and figure out whether or not we're dealing with color data or with floating point data. If it's color data, we then need to take the individual grid cell values and convert them into uh, IH or intensity or HSI values and, and grab that intensity in order to difference those. So in terms of looping through a raster, that's actually fairly straightforward and a pretty common thing in raster data analysis. So for that, we use a nested for loop for each row in rows and for each column in column columns. There we go. We want to know before we evaluate any one grid cell whether or not that grid cell contains no data. If it's uh, you know a, a cell that contains no data, then we don't want to process it. We we effectively just want to leave it be. So if image row column is not equal to no data. Here we're working with valid data. And if that's the case, then we can actually process that, that uh, bit of information. Now, the next thing we want to do is sort out whether or not we're dealing with an image that is in fact colored data or if it's not. So if is colored data, then we're going to deal with this high pass filter in a different way than we would if it was in fact um, uh, you know, floating point values. So if it is color data, then what we want to do is, as I said, take the, the um, grid cell value for row column in input image, get the intensity value for it, get the intensity value for the bilateral, and difference those two things. So first off, we're going to call the image.get here we are, there's a function here called get value as HSI, that's hue, saturation, intensity. And we want to give it the parameters that tell us wh which grid cell we want, which is gonna be row column. And it returns three floating point values, which are of course the hue, saturation, and intensity. So H, S, and intensity. It's the intensity that we want, the hue and saturation we won't actually end up using. Oops, there we are. Now we want to do the exact same thing for the bilateral raster. We don't care if we overwrite the hue and saturation variables because as I said, we're not going to use them, but we do want two separate intensity values. There we go. Now, in the case of an RGB input image, we simply need to difference these two values to get the high, high pass uh, bilateral filter value we can output, but we need somewhere to output it. We don't yet have that. We want to create an output image that we would be able to stick this into. So let's do that now. To create an output image, effectively what we're going to do is say, well, we want it to be in the same space in terms of the same geographic extent as the input image, and we would like it to have the same number of rows and columns. So effectively to create a new image, we need to um, uh, give it a configs which we can grab from the input image. Configs is equal to image configs. That makes a copy of the metadata contained within the input image itself. There are some things that we're going to want to change, however. When we perform this high pass filter, the output will only contain floating point values. It won't contain RGB values. So whether or not the input image contains RGB, RGB values, the output image most certainly will not. So we need to update it so that 
oops, the data type contains floating point values. So we're going to need here, so from, from white box workflows import. So we want the raster data type. And in fact, we're going to need another thing. We're going to change the photometric interpretation. I'll talk about that in just a second. So that is equal to raster data type. As we said previously, we have various floating point values, signed integer values, unsigned integer values, and RGB values that raster data can hold. In our case, the output is going to be a 32-bit floating point, always. We're going to update the photometric interpretation. This is essentially a way that tells uh, the raster how to interpret the data that's contained within the cell. So regardless of the number of bits, this tells us whether or not it is um, interpreted as categorical data, continuous data, RGB values. So in our case, this should be interpreted as, so it's not Boolean, it's not categorical, it's continuous data. Once we've updated or created an appropriate configs, then we can very simply create our new output raster, create a variable name to hold it. And here we saw previously that we used the read raster. Well, not surprisingly, there is a new raster function here as well. So this requires us to provide a configs, which we've just created. And that's it. Now we will have a new raster in memory that has the same number of rows and columns, the same geographical extent, and have these properties in terms of the data that it holds. And we can very simply, oops, row column is equal to I1 minus I2. So this is the scenario where our input image is in fact RGB data, but now let's deal with the scenario where the input image actually just contains continuous data. So for that, it's even simpler. Output row column, we just need to difference the input image from the bilateral image. Image row column minus bilateral row column. That's effectively the long form on a grid by a grid cell by grid cell basis of what we did previously when we just differenced the rasters. The only other thing that I'd like to do here now is to update the progress, right? Um, we set this to verbose so we know when we run the bilateral filter we're going to have output sent to the terminal, but when currently it's doing our little Python based um, high pass filter, we're not getting any sort of user output to know uh, whether or not um, you know, we're progressing adequately. Generally speaking, you could calculate the progress for every completed pixel, but there's usually millions of pixels and that's far more times than we would need to calculate the progress. So typically speaking, we update the progress after completing an entire row. So here I'm gonna say progress is equal to, I'm gonna treat it as an integer value and I'm gonna take row plus one, because of course it's zero based, divided by the number of rows. Just to make sure that we're dealing with floating point values, to express it as a percentage, then I would multiply that by 100. Now, there are probably a lot more rows in the image than 100. And in truth, we really only need to update the progress 100 times. There's no sense in updating the progress, you know, many, many times when it hasn't changed its integer value. So for that, I need to see whether or not the progress is the same as what it was after I completed the previous row. So I need a variable to hold the previous progress. And the first row that I complete, very likely if I contain, if my image contains many rows, then it's gonna be rounded down to 0% completed. And so I just need to set old progress to anything that's not zero and then compare so if progress is not equal to old progress, then that would be an appropriate time where I have a new progress value. I've completed 1% effectively of the rows and it would be a good time to output. So print, I'm gonna do this as a formatted string, progress, put my variable of progress in there with the percent sign. And the last thing I need to do is just remember to um, update 
my old progress. There we go. Now, this would work no problem for us, but of course, we need to actually save the output image. So for that, we say WBE, we've seen the new image and the read, or sorry, new raster and read raster. Here we're gonna write raster. And this requires a raster object, in our case called output. It requires a file name, so I'm gonna call this bilateral.tiff, oops, I'm gonna call it high pass bilateral. This again would probably be, if I were to create this as a tool, a user input, rather than hard-coded like this. The last thing I need is whether or not we want to compress the output image, so we'll set that to true. And very lastly, probably we want something to inform the user when we run this script that, in fact, it's completed successfully. There we go. All right, let's run this tool now. Let's see if it works. So here it's running the bilateral filter, this line here at line 14 of our script, providing the output because again, we have told it to output to, to the command line with the verbose. Now it started the high pass filter in our Python script and it's progressing through that. You'll notice that it's outputting the progress as we've, as we've set up here, very nearly done. And now it's outputting the raster, the disk, and it's done. Let's take a look. So we created this new file called high pass bilateral. Does it look like what we expect? What my hypothesis was. So I figured that it would probably emphasize the texture, the local scale texture in areas that are fairly uniform. And it looks like that is pretty much what it's done. You can see it's got these sort of banded patterns on the roads where you can see the wear patterns on the pavement. You can see here we have, a, I think, probably a solar panel. You can see the texture associated with each of the grids of that solar panel. In areas that are fairly uniform, you can see that sort of modeled texture associated with that quite nicely. Beautiful. So I think this is actually quite worthwhile. I might end up developing this as an actual tool in the next release of Whitebox Tools and Whitebox Workflows for Python. So I hope that you've enjoyed this little demonstration on a practical use uh, for Whitebox Workflows for Python and that you can see how you might well incorporate it into your own workflows for fairly advanced geoprocessing. So that's it for today. Take care, everyone, and I hope you enjoy using Whitebox Workflows as much as I have. Bye now.